Hi, I'm Roland Sally, and I'm talking with David Ward today on the record, musicians on the record. I'm out in California, he's in Maine, so here's a little thing. If I was in San Diego when you was in Portland, Maine, I'd fly to you like stock and bone through hail and falling rain. Over the mountains and down in the valley, just trying to get to each other. Don't take us but a few minutes to get to one another. Hi, welcome to Musicians on the Record. I'm David Ward. You've heard the music, now hear their story, and you have definitely heard this guy's music. Since about 1985, my next guest has been the basis for Chris Isaac in Silvertone. He's also a Grammy Award winning songwriter. Roland Sally is on the show today. Welcome, Roland. Hey, great to be here. Thank you. So glad to have you here. Now, can we start with your song, Killing the Blues, won a Grammy when Robert Plant and Alison Krauss did a cover of that, and a bunch of other folks have done a cover. It's a beautiful, beautiful song. Um, I want to make sure that you also won the Grammy for that as well, right? I do. It's, uh, it's, it's not in the picture. It's hanging on my wall just around the corner there. I did win a Grammy. One uh, wins a Grammy when uh, the song he's written is is you know elected to win win the award. And uh, no matter who sings it, uh, the songwriter likewise gets the uh, gets the you know accolade or whatever you want to call it. It was really nice to get it. And Alison Krauss and Robert Plant did a great job on that song. Unusual. I never intended to be a two part harmony song, but man, they really nailed it. Yeah, they really did. Amazing version. Plus, Sean Colvin has done it. Oh, so Sean Colvin. I mean, it, that's my personal favorite is Sean's version of it. She, uh, she just, when I heard that, I just I fell down. <laughs> it was really yeah. so cool. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's a, it's a haunting song, Roland. And when I heard, I, I listened to the whole bunch of versions of it, including yours, which is great. I, I heard a little bit of Dylan in there. Uh, can you can you talk about the story about the song and what's the story behind it? Well, you know, so I, I I would refer to it as an authentic song because it's actually um, um, autobiographical. I guess I have to say uh, it's you know it's a song about about a personal situation and we, we you know we get we get fuel from those for songwriting and. Uh, there was someone I was with at the time, and uh, we we had agreed to to well, frankly, just say clean up our act. And uh, so I I did it, and she uh, she slipped, and we uh, we just um, it was it was a it was a fork in the road, and we came to that fork in the road, and I took it. <laughs> right. And um, uh, it was just uh, it was it was it was tough tough situation and I woke up one morning I was feeling so bad about it in my new little you know apartment up in Woodstock New York and uh, made myself a cup of coffee and that song kind of fell out on the table maybe took maybe about nine minutes <laughs> wow amazing when when did you write that song Roland it was a long time ago back in in, in the mid 70s yeah yeah and so you have been around a long time <laughs> Thankfully, right? Thankfully, yeah. And so you wrote it and recorded it. Did you have any idea or, or no, that wasn't the story of it? I had a good friend at the time in Woodstock named Jim Collier, who isn't with us anymore, but he's a fabulous songwriter, great singer. We were just so, so close and together. We would sing, we had a little band going, we were really great friends. And um, there was kind of this thing where, where, when, where he'd write a song and bring it in and we'd, we'd look at it together and then I'd write one and bring it in and it was kind of this thing where we were kind of a team, you know, and when we wrote when, that particular song, when I wrote it, I finished it and I thought, I'm going to sing this for Collier because I think 
he'll understand for sure because he knows me. He'll understand where the song is coming from and everything, and I hope he likes it. But, you know, when you write a song uh, like that and it, you, don't, you don't belabor it too much, um, sometimes you're not sure if you've really written anything worthy or a good song or anything that'll stand up. It just comes so quick and you kind of, so I put that away and said, I'll sing this tomorrow and see uh, if, if it holds water in the morning. So the next day I kind of pulled out my guitar and ran it down and it sounded okay to me. So I played it for Jim and then I played it for another friend of mine named Johnny Harold from the Bluegrass Boys back in, back in the, in the village days. And he looked at me and he said, that song, it's going to go somewhere. He goes, I'll bet you $100 right now that song will do something. I, and I shook on it. And so years and years later, I sent him $100. Yeah. <laughs> he won the bet, right? Thankfully. Right? <laughs> yeah. you, pay up. <laughs> you bet. You bet. And I mean, I, I, I don't imagine you had any idea what life that song would take on of its own with these amazing other yeah. artists like yourself yeah. playing it. You, you never do. Um, uh, sometimes if you write lyrics that are, that are pertinent to a certain time or a certain, certain events that are going on, like in a, in a given time, like really specific, the song may turn out to be more of a, as a, of a specific time related song, but then other lyrics seem to sort of apply in general at any time. And if you're lucky, you can get a song you know, where you subtract it out enough of the, uh, you know, the current stuff and you, you get a broad meaning that, that sort of pertains to people in general and situations that people are going to be coming into throughout the history of mankind. You, you're lucky to get a song that will, you know, that'll stand up over time, but you don't even you really know. Maybe some people do. I suppose the, the guys who wrote Somewhere Over the Rainbow probably figured that they had some had a pretty good fish on the line. You know? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And you've written a lot of songs. I mean, you're clearly not just the bass player, um, but I'd love to hear more about your story because we try to get the musician story on the show here. When did music start for you? When did you fall in love with the bass and songwriting? How did that happen for you? There was always, uh, the first song I remember really loving when I was a kid was a song by Jim Reeves, and it was called He'll Have to Go. And I thought that was a pretty, again, a pretty time, time-worn time song that would last forever. <clears throat> and I love that song. I love the way, the way it sounded. And I probably you know, just a little kid at the time. And uh, uh, I knew from that song what the power of the song could be uh, if it was written you know, and, and, and so, and, uh, uh, I didn't really think about writing songs when I was too young, but, but when I, I picked up the bass when I was 15, uh, what happened was, um, my cousin and a couple of friends of mine from high school, we wanted to start a band. So we got all the equipment together that we needed for a band and we threw it in town and in the garage floor and said, well, what are you going to play? And so he picked the drums and the other guy picked the guitar. My cousin picked the piano and the only thing left on the floor was the bass. So I became a bass player that day. Okay. And, um, at the time I was a, a long distance runner in high school, <clears throat> a student. And of course, you know, when, if you pick, picked up a guitar and got into music at that time, you naturally just kind of wanted to grow your hair out a little bit right? sure. you know, with it. And, yeah. uh, uh, so I showed up my senior year in high school with 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 something other than a crew cut, which was a known home. And uh, the, the coach uh, kicked me off the team, and that's how I got my start in music. Okay, <laughs> that was what um, your path was supposed to be. It sounds like. But the song, the songs at that time were coming hot and heavy. They were coming from from people here in America. They were coming from from. From the, from the Beatles and, and, and you know, they're the white great songwriters. I mean, anybody that could that would study any number of Beatles songs would be going to the University of Songwriting, I, I think. Uh, uh, and, 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 of course, many others, Carole King. Um, uh, I, you know, I'm going to leave out millions if I start telling them most of them, but there's great, you know, there were great songs coming in. And I don't know, I, I, for some reason, we never, I was never in a cover band. Uh, we just always, I was, even, even when I was just getting started, my group was called The Group. I mean, we covered a few songs, but we moved towards uh, 
writing our own stuff. It's just kind of, a, of, of an avenue you take and you sort of stay with it. And uh, it gets comfortable. And you, in, in fact, covering songs begins to feel a little uncomfortable uh, if you do too much of it. Although it's a great way to learn, you know, how to, how to, how to deliver a song. Uh, when I was 18, I moved out of my hometown and went up to Madison, Wisconsin and started a band and we were 100% original. And we never did covers. Then I guess I've been doing that ever since. At least that's the way I think. Yeah. So that's if fascinating. Sing, my, my, yeah. If you're going to sing a song, it might as well be your own. Sure. Right. So, do you remember the, some of the first songs you wrote then? Oh, I had a, I had, I had a, one of the first ones I wrote was called Cowboy Woman. Um, it was just kind of a rock and roll song about a woman who she was kind of a cowboy, but she was a woman and she. You know, didn't she, let's say she was alien gender. Um, <laughs> she, uh, she she was um, uh, independent, free running, you know, horse riding, uh, tough talking mama. You know, yeah. it, was, it was kind of interesting song. People like that song, and there there were a few others, um, quite a few others actually from the old band. I could name a couple, but no one would know them. I don't think. Sure. Okay. And were there any important teachers for you, Roland, musically, whether the bass or even songwriting or any other musical teachers that came? You know, I never had a teacher really, other than just listening as a bass player. Because as a bass player, I was trying to learn the bass, and I was also also conscious of um, songs and lyrics, and and making sure that the lyrics were were as good as you can make them. And mostly that's done by subtracting out the chaff, you know, and trying to stick with what, what's, you know, the, the meat and potatoes of, of, of the lyrics of the song. But I was trying to learn bass lines and trying to learn how to sing and play bass at the same time, which is a bit of a challenge at first, you know? Sure. And there was one song that, that, that I had to sing in the band because I, I could sing and it was called Hey Joe, it was by, no, now you're going to come. It was either by the leaves or by the seeds. But Jimi Hendrix later, later covered it. Sure. Uh, and it had a pretty, you know, moving bass line, which, which to try to sing it and play it at the same time, it took me weeks to figure that out. I'd come home from school and just work on it. And finally, it, it, it all fell together at once, and I was able to sing and play the song at the same time. But that taught me a lot about singing and playing that particular song. And then, you know, we moved, moved into it other songs uh, uh, where you, you know, have to sing and play, which yeah. good education. Sure, that's incredible. And who, I mean, I know we'll probably leave some folks out just because that's the nature of this, but who were you listening to on bass that was inspiring you and songwriting-wise, other music? James Jamerson, James Jamerson was knocking me out because he was so good and so unique and, 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 and his tone was so good and he was so musical and, and uh, I found out later that he never played, even in studio, he never played uh, any take of any particular song the same way twice. He was just like a like an open faucet fountain of, of bass playing, and his story was fabulous. You know, he was he was he was not really an expert in anything except playing the bass. <laughs> uh, Paul McCartney was really in there for sure. Um, Carol Kay from the Wrecking Crew was really great. I loved her tone and. Um, Duck Dunn, we, we I cannot leave out Duck Dunn, who's may he rest in peace. What a fabulous bass player! And by the way, interesting, yeah, he was left-handed, but he played right-handed bass, which means that his strong hand was on the on the fingerboard. Right. And for whatever that's worth, I don't know how how that transmitted or trans trans you know translated into his tone, but his tone was, was fabulous and his time was powerful. Wow. So good. Wow. Incredible. Can you, you know, with some of the stuff that I talk about or ask musicians on the show is because you've had such a, uh, a rich and historic career around this, some of it is advice for up and coming future musicians as well. You clearly, you know, with Chris Isaac and others, you, you're part of that rhythm section that is really so important of holding the bottom line. Can you say a little bit about like, what is the, what is the top one or two things you got to pay attention to in the rhythm section? 
Well, when you're playing with a drummer, uh, I, I find it's nearly impossible for a bass player who's playing with his fingers. I mean, there's these guys who play real percussively and which, which the bass is a combination of a, of, a, of a bass and a drum, kind of. But when you're playing with your fingers, and, and you know, in, in, in the old, kind of the old style or the traditional style of playing bass, there's, it's almost impossible for a bass player to, to customize what the drummer is going to do. Uh, you, and, and what I'm trying to say is you have to listen to the drummer and you have, to, you have to be comfortable with what he's doing and you have to be able to follow him. You have to listen closely uh, and because, because we're, we're human, right? And, and, and a drummer who's human uh, is going to do, make some human, human, you know, things. There's going to be some shifting and some moving around and some innuendo and, uh, and things like that. And you can't, you can't fight the drummer ever. You have to play with the drummer. Uh, um, and sometimes you have to let go of time, uh, your sense of perfect time, because that doesn't always work. Uh, the Rolling Stones are a good example of that, because Keith Richards leads that man um, uh, with his rhythm playing, as far as I can tell. And Charlie Watts follows Keith Richards. Now, now the, the key here is that people are listening to each other. Charlie Watts follows Keith Richards, and then Bill Wyman listened to Charlie Watts, the drummer. So there was a chain kind of of, uh, of a three-way, three-link three chain, which developed and, 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 and carved out the, the feel of the Rolling Stones. And it's by no means perfect. I mean, you put a, put a metronome or a quick track on that, and it's really new. But ragged but right is, is all I can say about that. And, and that's... I think that's, I, I like ragged, but right rhythm sections. Um, the, the perfect, you know, sterile, perfect, you know, exact rhythm sections, I don't know, they don't move me as much. They're, they're, it's impressive, but it just doesn't move me as much as, uh, as when you really listen and don't try to hard nose it. Just listen and be, be a combo team player. Mm. Yeah, I love it. And great advice. Uh, and for me as a drummer, I, I love that because in my head, I'm like, oh, I need to follow the bass player. So it's kind of cool to hear you say you got to follow the drummer. <laughs> nice. I, you know, I've often uh, tried to imagine what it would be like to be a drummer in a band. And I have no idea. <laughs> I can't imagine. He's in the driver's seat. Uh, he's um, w w without, without a drummer who can, who can, who can, you know, deliver and render a song, uh, the song um, you've you've got a problem <laughs> right i like i read a read an interview one time with buddy rich um who they, they you know they he interviews and he's in modern drummer and the interview was long many many pages of interviews a lot of great questions and stuff like that and finally at the end of the at the end of the interview the guy said to him, well, what inter uh, what advice would you give a young drummer who's coming up right now and he's got time problems buddy rich goes quit <laughs> Not to quit, but um, uh, you know, time is uh, time is relative. That you know, you know, you, songs need sometimes need to be massaged and, uh, and, and and delivered carefully. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome stuff. Um, so, can we go back a little bit as well, Roland? And you know, when you're 18 and you're, before you're thinking about moving, you said you moved to Wisconsin, correct? I did move from 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 northern Illinois up to up to Madison, Wisconsin, which was a big uh, university town with a lot of uh, foreign blood from both from all over the country. It was a really great melting pot. That blew me away. Okay, awesome. So, what was the musical dream that you had formed at that point, as well as when you told the folks, "Hey, I'm moving and going to be making my way with music"? What was their reaction? Well. <clears throat> My dad, uh, who I love and who's a great character, uh, did most of the talking in that in that conversation. And his uh, his uh, he he had been a military man. He'd been all through World War II, D-Day, Battle of the Bulge, Battle of Holland. He had you know war stories that, that, that you know that, that could have been movies in and of themselves. But but um, and he you know he was hoping uh, that I would you know, be a military man, which, which was never going to work. I mean, I, you're looking at probably the least likely to succeed in the military person right here. Uh, 
but um, when when it finally came down to it, I was I, I was just about to turn 18, and he took me out on the back porch. We lived out in the country. He took me out in the back of the house in Vegas. See that cornfield right there? I go, yeah. He goes, I want you to take your base. He goes, walk through that cornfield. He goes, when you get to the other side, keep on going, and don't come back. Wow. <laughs> uh, that was that was how that conversation went. So. Yeah. It was kind of an unusual, different kind of support that I had from my dad and my, and my folks. Uh, they never thought that it was going to it was going to be a, a viable thing to do, but um, he did understand that. If and here's the other thing, I would say, don't ever give up because you, you could be winning and not even know it. You know, and uh, I never did give up. There were plenty of times when I had like I had a dime in my pocket. And it was Thanksgiving, and everybody had gone home for Thanksgiving. And I was just sitting there, and so I would go down and buy dimes worth of popcorn for Thanksgiving. That's called you know paying your dues. Yeah. I finally uh, got to the point where I was able to pay my rent, you know, by playing. And uh, and there was a number of years where we didn't really communicate much between me and my folks, but. Then when, when I got with Chris, we got on Johnny Carson one night and my dad was, and folks, my folks were home in Illinois and I think they must have switched on the TV and they saw me on TV and then it started to sort of mellow out. And by the time, uh, by the time my folks had passed away, we were, we were just perfect. Everything was great. Oh, I'm so glad to hear it. And they kind of went like this, ooh, and then it came back together. Yeah, so they got to see your success. Pardon me? They got to see your success. They wanted the best for you. They did, and um, um, uh, my mother was around when uh, when we did when the Grammy um, came came my way. Uh, my father was around, and, and by the way, he was a carpenter. And at, towards the end of uh, his life, we did a few pretty good carpentry projects together, and that was really good because uh, you know he was. I mean, we 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 patched up a lot of stuff from by swinging hammers together, you know, it was really great. That's right. Uh, Sometimes that's the best way to do it. Not, yeah. always, not always by talking, but some kind of action like that. That's yeah. Great. So can we talk a little bit about then connecting with Chris Isaac for you, Roland? How did that happen? What's the story behind that? Well, I had been um, living in Los Angeles and I had a band with uh, Pete Anderson who later became the, the guitar player and the producer for Dwight Yoakam when Dwight first started. And uh, we, this was before, right before Pete hooked up with Dwight and right before I hooked up with Chris, we had a band, it was a blues band in Los Angeles called the Blue Monkeys. And played a lot, you know, uh, in, in the bars, you know, doing the four or five sets, you know, six nights a week kind of thing around Los Angeles. And, um, we had a we had a drummer. Well, we had we had a number of drummers, and we were having trouble sort of keeping a drummer. And we played this little bar called Omahomies down in Santa Monica uh, every Friday night or something it was. And um, one night, when our drummer had been he was an hour late, and everybody was just exasperated, and you know he was he was hammered when he came to work and stuff. I mean, he was a great guy. I loved him, and he was yeah. a cool drummer to play with. But you just I mean he was a bit unpredictable. Let's put it that way. Yeah. So. We took a break uh, in the middle of the night, and, and we, I looked up, and you know, there were little tables around there. There was a table over there, and Jim Gordon was sitting at a table. Now, I don't know if anybody knows the Jim Gordon story, but he's, uh, he, he was on the Wrecking Crew. He was an L.A. drummer. He played drums on these boots are made for walking. He, 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 he took him out of high school to, to cut that Nancy Sinatra track. And he, was, he was a fabulous drummer, just a natural really great drummer and he played with everybody by that time this was in the uh this was in 1980 i believe he played with Derek and the dominoes john john lennon and i mean the list goes on and on of course yes i know who you're talking about now roland sure. yeah, great drummer so he got in the band he, what happened was look at there he was at the table and so we went over and and started talking to him hey you're jim gordon and he goes oh hey, he's a really nice guy you know and uh, so we Pete was there, and he said, yeah, geez, he goes, I don't know, he said, we're, we're going to need a drummer, uh, looks like, pretty soon. Do you know anybody who might want to join the band? He goes, how about me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, I'll, I'll join. He goes, I'd love to, love to 
get back to playing. You know, he goes, I've been, you know, doing all kinds of different things. He goes, but I, what I really want to do is start playing regular music like regular bands do again. He, he said, geez, man, if you want to join our band, we'd be like, we have to pinch ourselves because you are So he joined the band. Well, that went great for a while, but Jim was having problems there. And um, he, uh, he kept them pretty well under, under, under wraps, but we began to be able to see that he was, he was really struggling with something inside himself. And it turned out he, 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 he went and um, he, was, he was hearing his mother's voice in his head. He had, he had uh, schizophrenic things going on. And Jim is still there. He's, he's still around. Um, and he, he may hear this. And I don't want to, I don't want to say anything that he, that, that isn't accurate or that he would not like to hear back on the, on the interview, but um, he killed his mother basically is what he did uh, and to try to stop the voices that is what I, what I understood. So that broke up that band and it, and it was a kind of a, yeah, well, it was a broadside really. I mean, we, we you come in your, in your band does something like that. It's really, mm. to say like massive. Sure. And, um, at that point, I decided that I kind of wanted to get out of Los Angeles just for a while and maybe try to move and get use some different air. And uh, the band kind of broke up. And I went on the road with Joan Baez uh, in, in 83. And um, our last gig was around Christmas time up in San Francisco. And Maria Moldauer came to the show. And uh, she, she was an old friend of mine. And we kind of hooked up and started spending a lot of time together. I moved up to, to San Francisco. Uh, and, you know, there was, I wasn't playing music for maybe three or four months and I kind of started to get itchy and I decided to go out to, uh, to a bar one night just to sit in with some friends and I went in and, and uh, sat in with this blues band and I jumped off stage and this guy came up to me who I recognized from another couple of years ago when I'd been, I had gone through uh, San Francisco with another musical situation and um, this guy said, who, hey, what are you doing here? I said, oh, I live here now. And he goes, oh my God. He goes, you, you're the perfect bass player for this band. We've been looking for a bass player forever. I said, well, who is it? He goes, well, it's this guy named Chris Isaac. And I said, well, never heard of him, you know? And uh, he said, well, here, we're having a record release party tomorrow. He's cut a couple songs and he's, he's going to debut them at this, this uh, hotel here in town. So I went down and met him and we shook hands and uh, started rehearsing the next day. And that was, I think, in 84. Wow. 1984, maybe it was 85. Look that up. <laughs> Incredible, though. And had you been in the studio recording before any of that, Roland? Well, yeah, we'd um, we'd done a lot, uh, a lot of different little things in Los Angeles. I'd cut cut some records and a lot of stuff in Woodstock, New York, before I moved before I moved uh, out to Los Angeles. And you know, I'd been up in Canada a couple of times. Uh, traveled around, you know, it, I was 30, probably 35 when I started with Chris. So I'd, I'd had a whole long stretch of musical stuff happen before, you know, before I met Chris. Sure. So, you know, you're working these gigs, you're doing sessions, you're, you're playing with some bands. I'll, I'll go back to Chris in a moment, because certainly I want to talk a lot more about him. What would you consider to be your big break, especially like after you left home at 18 and went for this career in music? Well, uh, like I say, sometimes, you know, it's just an event that seems innocuous and maybe not really, uh, not really much of, a, of an event at all. But, but it turns out later on, you realize what, what hinged off of that. And the, the band that I had in Wisconsin, it was called Oz. It was a three-piece band, and we wanted to do some recording. We knew Tracy Nelson. I don't know if, if people have heard of her. She, she was a singer in a band called Mother Earth, and she's, she is a great singer, great blues singer. And she was from Madison, and, and she had moved down to Nashville, Tennessee. So we, we decided we wanted to try to stretch out a little bit, so we wanted to go check out Nashville, and we, we were going to go down and visit Tracy Nelson down there. So we did. And when we went down, she was in the studio cutting a record in Nashville. It's called at a place called Jack's Tracks, and which turned out to be a studio owned by Jack Clement. And uh, 
we walked in and Tracy was in the, in the studio there and, and, and there was a fellow named Scotty Moore running the board. And, 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 and I didn't put it together until after we walked out of it. That's Scotty Moore. The Scotty, Scotty Moore. Moore. Scotty Moore. Scotty Moore. Wow. You know, this is you know, a guitar player. Sure. Very, very uh, you know, humble, uh, you know, really easy going guy. He was the engineer. He was working the board in there. You know. he, he should have been out in the studio playing guitar, but he was, you know, he was probably, you know, I mean, Elvis had, had, had gone to LA and, and, and had a new band by that time, but, but he was. He and Jack Clement and those guys were all sticking in, in Nashville and carrying on. And um, so Tracy took a little break and uh, there was two studios in that building and I heard some music coming from one of the other studios down the hall. So I went down and poked my head in and there was two guys in there from New York making an album named Happy and Artie Tron. I said, hey, oh, how's it going? Are you, uh, what are you guys doing? Oh, we're making a record. Oh. He said, yeah, here, listen, this is what we're about to cut. So they, they played a version of, of a song that they were recording, and I listened to it, and I liked them. You know, they were nice guys. Didn't think anything about any of that. We went back up to Nashville, uh, to uh, Madison, and uh, carried on. Then, then when my uh, Madison band dissipated, and I moved out to Woodstock, New York. So I'm walking down the street in Woodstock one day, thinking about getting a sandwich or whatever in the middle of the day. Hey, Rolly, I hear somebody. I turn around and, and it's Artie Trong. I go, Artie, you're the guy from Nashville. He goes, yeah, you're the guy from Nashville too. I go, yeah. He goes, what are you doing? I go, well, I live here now. See, this is the thing. <laughs> if you move someplace and you, you know, you get into situations, you start mixing around, you get off the couch and, and you know, that day it was, I got off the couch to go get a sandwich. Uh, I ran into Artie coming. What are you doing? He goes, well, we live here and we're, we're looking for a bass player. My brother and I. So I ended up playing with Happy and Artie in Woodstock uh, uh, for a number of years. And you, not many people may have heard of them in, 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 in you know, certain circles, but they're well-known, well-respected, um, excellent uh, songwriters and musicians and, and, and folk aficionados, you know, from, they're from the village and they moved up to, uh, up to Woodstock. And, um, through them, I kind of really got my start, I would say, really to push out into the music, you know, the music business. Um, I made a lot of friends and came across a lot of, a lot of opportunities and a lot of cross-referencing just from playing with Happy and Artie again. We went to Europe for the first time. It was wow. amazing, 1979. Fantastic. When you come from a cornfield in Illinois, Europe might just as well be the backside of Pluto. Right. <laughs> Right. It's kind of the same thing, right? Yeah. yeah. It's about as hard to get there. Right. Yeah. Amazing. And, you know, this is one of the things I love about talking with musicians like yourself, Roland, is just the, the wonderful history lesson that we can all get. And if people don't know some of these artists that you're talking about, they're all on Google. So look them up. And uh, it's wonderful to hear about that. Um, were you guys at Woodstock, either in the crowd or on the stage? No, I, I moved there one year after the big one year after. Got it. I'm mm -hmm. big out there. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. That's fantastic. So if we can go back then to uh, Chris Isaac then. So you connect with Chris. What are some of the first songs that you start working on, whether you're helping writing or in the studio or playing live? Well, we, we uh, particularly we got involved in, in on, on the second record was when the band really, really congealed, you know, and um, I'm trying to remember what songs are on there. I remember, I, I do remember that um, uh, when we went to, when we went, we went on the road in Europe early and uh, we played little tiny clubs there and there was a little, some little bars that we were playing. Was, well, actually we played the Paradiso in Amsterdam and, um, the road manager was having trouble finding a, a, uh, a hotel for the band, but I already knew of one from when I'd been over in Amsterdam with Happy and Art. And I said, yeah, I know this little hotel. It's going to cost us a nice round figure, practically zero. <laughs> I mean, it was a real on the cheap hotel where the bathrooms were down the hall and stuff. <clears throat> and um, let's give those guys a call because we can probably get in there and we can afford it. We had none of them. We were traveling on a shoestring. Yeah. And, uh, so we went in there and uh, that's where Chris had the record jacket 
photo taken for the, the second album. It's, it, I think it's called, is it, it's not called Heart, is it called Heart Shaped World? Maybe, maybe Heart Shaped World. Anyway, uh, there's a good picture in the, on, on the jack, jacket of that cone. Yes, yeah. In the hotel. And, you know, the songs, um, the, the songs started, the, the, my first impression of Chris's songs were that they were kind of a cross between, they were kind of country, but they were kind of R&B-ish kind of, you know, he's, he's not a rockabilly guy. People think he's rockabilly. I, I kind of disagree with that. He can do rockabilly, but um, he's, got a, he's got a real funky, swampy sense of rhythm in his guitar playing, and it's, it's not country, although he can render a country song. But, but, but uh, he, there was something really different about him that, that, that was – it seemed like it was right up my alley because when I was coming up from Illinois, I'd had all the, all the blues stuff that, that was coming out of Chicago. I heard all that and, and, and kind of had it in my psyche. And then there was all the country stuff coming from all around there, you know, on the radio and stuff. And so I guess uh, I could play kind of blues and country. And, I, you know, I could, play with, I could play bass in a band with no drummer and I could play, you know, with a drummer because I'd done, done quite a bit of both. So... Uh, I, his music was just was really a good mix of stuff for me, you know. Uh, I remember we did a, we did a, a Devil Woman by Marty Robbins. That was one of the, one of the first. That was one of the covers that we did. Although we, we mostly did, uh, there was a song, like, song called Talk to Me. We did a song called Voodoo, uh, uh, The Lonely Ones. All these songs that they're, they're not they're not. Uh, rockabilly and they're not country and they're not blues there's some some kind of hodgepodge of, of, of all of it and yeah of course his voice is you know something you can really get behind yeah i agree and it does seem like a mix of all of that it's fantastic music i love it uh, you know some of the my favorites are i believe uh, yeah baby did a bad bad thing of course yeah. All of those classics that, that are. That was an interesting song. You, well, we'll talk about Baby Did a Bad, Bad Thing. When I first met Chris, um, after that day in the, uh, in the hotel, and then when he said, you know, should we shoot a can? He said, come down, let's, let's, let's play together tomorrow. So he said, here's where, we're, here's where I want, want you to come tomorrow at, you know, six o'clock at night. So it was in the really what they call the bits of town. It was the, it was the derelict wharf section of San Francisco. Okay. We cleaned it up, but back then it was it was a wreck. It was a train wreck, <laughs> and there was a row of uh, buildings on on Third Street down there that were kind of derelict. And um, he he gave me the address, and I got to the place, and it was boarded up. It was it was an old bar, obviously, but it was the, there were padlocks on the door and the boards in the window, bars on the window, no paint on the front of the thing, and it, you know it was just you couldn't even see in the place. So I'm banging on the door. And the door opened, and it was just one of those rooms. There was nothing in the room but, but um, like dirt, like fallen plaster down off the off the, the ceiling. And everything it was just. I mean, it was like it was it was just about two degrees away from being outside. You know, <laughs> yeah. So it was my friend Mark Plummer who introduced me to Chris, uh, who, who I'd seen at the bar that night. He says, "Come on." So we walked. Up to the back of the place, out the back door, and then into the sort of, there was a backyard, and the grass was probably, you know, eight feet tall, just weeds, and there was, there were feral dogs back in there and stuff, and we went out the back, turned around, and came back in through the little stairway down into the basement of the place, which was even worse. I mean, it made the upstairs look nice, you know? And uh, it was a dirt floor, and there, there had been like leaking pipes, so the dirt, it turned quickly into a mud floor, and it was cold, and the ceiling was about maybe, maybe five foot nine, you know, you had to crouch down to get through there, and there was a room back in there. I went back in there, there was a drum set back there, sitting next to a mud hole. A couple of amps, and Chris and our manager, very important guy named Eric Jacobson, who, who uh, produced all of the Love and Spoonfuls hits back in the 60s. He um, did Norman Greenbaum, Spirit in the Sky. He did a lot of things, and uh, he, he, he was our producer and manager for the for the a good number of years until not that long ago. Uh, uh, you know, he's instrumental in, in, in helping Chris get up and get going. And he was a great, great guy to be around. But he was there. Jimmy Wilsey, the original guitar player, was there. And Kenny Johnson. So it was the four guys plus me. And the room was like just damp and horrible. And there was water dripping in. And there was just one little like, dirty light bulb shining the thing. 
And I looked over and we were freezing. And this was like March or February of the year. So I looked over and laying in a mud puddle was an old rusted out heater, electric heater with no cord on it. So I went over and picked it up and kind of brushed it off. And said, you know, if we put a plug on this, we plug it in, it might work. And so I wired it up and plugged it in. And sure enough, the little, you know, it looked like kind of like, a, kind of like half a toaster, you know, and, and the little wires heated up. And now looking at me and went, maybe this guy's not so dumb, you know, we want to keep this guy in the van. He's got stills. <laughs> and, and they were impressed with that. They got a little heat in the room. But, but when we started playing, it was kind of obvious that we had a, we had a band. I've talked with other musicians who've talked about some of the challenges and obstacles they've had to go through and overcome and ultimately learn some of the lessons from. Uh, can you talk a little bit about those for you? What are some of those challenges, those difficulties in the music business um, that you've learned from and are growing from? Well, the, the challenges are always there. They, they kind of change. You know, people say, oh, once, once you finally make it, everything's going to be sweet. It's going to be easy, you know, but, but that's, that's not true. That is really not true. You, uh, you, you, have, to, you have to lean into this uh, as hard as you did when you first started, uh, just in a different way. But when, when I first started, the hardest thing was just trying to get fed. I mean, you know, literally, like, I mean, trying to, trying to be able to, you know, to, to keep, first of all, to keep your gear safe and dry. Like, and, and, and if, you're, if you're a guitar player or, or you know, whatever your instrument is, it's your instrument. And then if, it's, if you're a bass player, it's your bass, and then it's your amp. You know, you've got to have those two things in good shape. Otherwise, you know, you're not going to be able to, to deliver in any, you know, at the drop of the hat. So you got to keep those. So, so almost secondary is, um, is, you know, food. <laughs> you got to, you got to be able to, you know, to keep yourself together and, 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 uh, you know, so you got to keep number one, if you're starting out as a musician, I, I found that I wanted to keep my gear really good and sounding great and safe and, uh, you know, not up for grabs, you know, in any way, by hook or by crook. And um, then you want to get fed, and then you want to get, get something on that looks, you know, fairly like it's together if you can. And uh, although that's not really that important because, because when you're in the studio, nobody cares what you look like. If you, if you land down a good track, you know, you can be King Kong, you know, in a tutu, no one cares. But um, um, then, when you get with people, some of the, oftentimes the challenge are, okay, now I'm in a group of people and we're trying to make a go of this, and who are these people, and who am I in relation to these people, and how are we together? Because once it's, give, it's a given that you're able to play, then you kind of have to be able to hang. You know, you've got to be able to hang out and, and, and uh, cooperate, literally cooperate. Um, with, with, with your group, uh, you can't, you know, you can't try to try to stiff arm or hard nose a situation and say, this is the way it's got to be. You've got to be able to, to form, to function as a team. Uh, some people find that harder than others. You know, uh, I'd like to say I'm fairly easy going and didn't, didn't, didn't create, haven't created too many waves or too many, you know, situations. Um, You've got your standards, you know, you just got to try to everybody's to collectively keep your standards up and, and do all that. And uh, then you may be going along uh, for a couple of years and you may say, well, this isn't really working for me. This isn't as, as uh, happening as, as big or as, you know, as beautifully, I'm not making enough money or, you know, I don't live in a, in a, in a I can't pay my rent or, you know, I'm, I've got to stay in a little apartment and I want to, I want to have a room that's some rooms that are bigger. I want to have maybe, Maybe you get to the point where you say, I want to have a girlfriend or a wife and a family. And um, these are some of the sacrifices that, that you might have to make at some point to make a decision. Do I really want to stick with this? Because there are maybe a number of things that are pulling you in, in the other direction. People are talking to you. Maybe you hear something from the past. That somebody said, you know, you can, you're going to really succeed as a doctor or something. You know, uh, uh, 
just any any of those influences that are coming around you, you, you know, you see things on TV. Oh, look at him. He's got a great car, you know, or, you know, he's, he's living the fast life. And here I am in this little band. But again, I say, don't give up unless you're really ready to. And even then, put it off until the last possible minute because you could be, uh, you could be out there making big waves somewhere and, you're not, and you wouldn't even know it sitting in your little, little house, you know, because it's not always apparent that you're making it. Uh, stay with it. Don't give up. Love it. Yeah. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. So uh, great advice, especially for, again, up and coming. You know. Yeah. And another thing, when, when, when you finally get to the top, let's say, I haven't been there, but <laughs> I, I can see what it's like. When you finally do get to the top, uh, the food's better, you know, the places that you stay are better, but you still have to have yourself. Uh, it's you and yourself at the end of the day. And you think, how did I do? How did I, uh, how did I, you know, did, did I do as good as I can possibly do? And, uh, and, you know, have I, have I lived up to my stand, my own personal standards, whatever they may be. Sure. Absolutely. And, and that, that feels the same as it did when you were, when you were 14 years old, you know, you figured out which end of the drumstick play with you know that's right that's right yeah it's all always it's always still us right so my, my, my great grandmother at one point she was i think she was 91 or something and, uh, and i said well oh you, when i get to be 91 I, i'm gonna i want to be like you and know everything and have it all together and she said don't kid yourself she said i'm still trying to figure it out right right yeah i love it wow but, right Good to know what we don't know as well, right? Or that we don't know things. Yeah. Mm. Can you talk about, Roland, some of the, the differences for you um, mindset-wise, even as a professional, going into the studio as well as playing live? What's different, what's similar uh, mindset-wise for you? Well, the studio, of course, what you finally, what finally makes it on, on the recording is never going to go away. And, and you're pretty, pretty aware of that. So I'm, for me as a bass player, I'm pretty conscious, conscious in the studio trying to make each note count and not overplay. And also not, I'm very careful about the, about the singer's melody uh, because he can be, 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 executing a melody that lays over a certain, you know, chord or, or, or chord progression. And I can play a bass line that sounds great with that chord progression, but it might not go with what the singer is, is doing. So I'm, I'm always trying to make sure that I don't clash with, with, with the, the, the vocal melody. I try to try, and I always try to, try to play a little bit less if I can, try to subtract out notes. So it's a, it's a, it's a mental tussle in the studio to try to, to try to get something that you think is going to, is going to sound good and hold up uh, when you hear it five years from now or when anybody hears it, you know, it's, and, and I always find it simpler is better. Uh, I always make sure that I, that I'm, I'm physically comfortable and, and, you know, I've, I've, I've eaten, gotten a good amount of sleep, had, you know, had plenty of water back in the day. I make sure I, you know, I didn't have too many beers the night before. Just, just try to try to go into the studio uh, in as good a shape as you can, because um, you might be there for hours. You might be there for fourteen hours cutting something. That baby did a bad, bad thing. Was an interesting, more interesting example of that. Um, but um, uh, so the studio is is it's critical. I, I feel because you, what you do is is going to it's, it's going to outlast you. <laughs> You know. right. uh, playing live is more of a hoot. It's just more fun. Uh, uh, some bands approach it differently, but our band, we, we, you know, we pretty much roll up our sleeves and just, just go in there and have a ball. And uh, you know, I have to, I, I tend to play a little more and a little more, uh, 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 you know, ex, ex, in an extra way. Uh, exuberantly when I play just because it's fun and I think it translates to the crowd when you go out in front of a crowd see and you've got the whole crowd feeding you energy and then you feed it back which isn't the case in the studio it's all pretty much all in your head you're just trying to make a make a, a good model that's going to lay lay straight forever and, and, and live is uh, it's a hoot man yeah a lot of fun so I don't worry about that when I'm playing live 
let's go out and have fun. And our band is, you know, it's a fun band when we play live. Any uh, pre-show rituals for you or the band before you guys get on stage? <laughs> There is, but I can't, I can't put it on this. That's fine. Okay. We, always, we all go like this. We put our hands in right before we go on and go, hey. That's the part where. Love it. Make up, fill in the blank. Right, right. But we, we, we in, a, in, a, in, a, in a unspecified way and in an un, uh, un, unordained way, we, we all get our minds and our heads all in the same spot uh, for the show, you know, for about an hour before the show where we're, we're tuning everything else out and we're focusing on it as a group in our, in our different ways. And when we come to come to the stage, we're, we're, we're ready to go. We're looking to have a good time. Yeah. And, and I'm imagining that's your intention of what you want the crowd to be feeling. When well, we, every guy in our band knows implicitly that, every person in the crowd has plunked down some money that they had to work to get. And, and they've spent that money on themselves and whoever they've come with and uh, taken time to get there, park the car, walk into the place and, uh, and, and have a good time. I and mean, we feel that like, that so we owe them uh, the best effort. Even if you got the flu, you just put that aside, go out there and, 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 and throw down because because they have, so we will do, even if there's 15 people in the crowd. I can think of a couple of shows in the early days where, where the band outnumbered the crowd. Mm. <laughs> but we still went for the juggler vein, you know, <laughs> in their situation. But I, I, think it's, I think people deserve it. They come to see a show, and we actually feel like uh, every show we do is, our, uh, is an audition for the next one. Awesome. Yeah. Where do you want your music to go, Roland? Uh, obviously, you guys are still playing. You were just here in Portland, Maine. I'm bummed that I missed you guys. Uh, but but what's what's coming up, or where do you want it to go? You know, of course, uh, we, we, when we play, we have a certain uh, we're in a certain echelon, let's say, of of, of business. Uh, it's all would always be great to increase that. Um, we're grateful for what we what we have at the moment. Uh, when people come to, you know, we, we, if we play a, an eleven hundred seater and we go out there and there's there's you know, ten ten hundred and ninety nine people that we're just as happy as as, as can be. You know, uh, grateful for that. Uh, we just want to keep making good music. Uh, I, I don't think we're we're worried about about the crowd that much uh, we just feel that uh, because we've got a, we've got a good fan base and we're, and we're, and we're lucky and grateful for it uh, uh, we just want to keep making the best music we can right. um, and whatever that turns into up or down is, is at least we've, we've done the best that we can I don't, I don't think any of us are going to try to uh, do any, any bungee jumping off the off the Empire State Building to uh, try to turn heads. We're just going to keep making good music. Absolutely. Yeah. For you in the past or any current, uh, any dealing with nerves before a show? And if so, how do you deal with it? Or how did you deal with it if you had that in the past? Nerves before the show? Yeah. Oh. Um, it's, been, it's been a long time since I felt anything, but, but let me add them, you know, kind of kind of a feel. It's been, been a long time. There was, the first time I was really nervous was when, I, when, when my group in Wisconsin opened three shows for Jimi Hendrix, because there were about 50,000 people at the first show, and, uh, and uh, you want to talk about petrified. I bet. I remember how I moved my arms and legs to get on stage, but I did. And, and I was really, really just like for the whole thing, Here's what happened. For the first three songs of, of, the, of that set, Hendrix's equipment was behind us, and we were in front of him, and they, they were, when we were done, they would clear our stuff and then pull the curtain, and his stuff would be there. So we had this one little acoustic part of the song. It went way down quiet, and then the band kind of came in, and our lead guy was doing this, delivering this acoustic part. So I'm in the wings waiting to come in, you know, and be all theatrical about it and stuff. <laughs> Suddenly I hear this, 
what's going on? And I go back and I look around the night and it's Mitch Mitchell. And he's taking a drum solo. He has no idea that there's a band on stage in front. And he's back there, he's practicing his drum, but it was like, you know, like Charlie Brown, it was like a, like a blur and there's sticks flying out here, the leg over here, arm here, whack, 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 just cymbals flying and stuff. And, and it's, it's destroying our little quiet part out in front. Just at that moment, I see my girlfriend, who's a big girl from New York. She's coming from the other side of the state. She's sprinting like, like this. And, and it's, it's like in slow motion. She's like, <laughs> she gets about 10 feet from Mitch Mitch, launches herself, grabs him around the neck, hauls him off the drums, and just proceeds to beat the crap out of him. Oh my God. <laughs> My boyfriend's out there coming to the thing. <laughs> somehow that broke the tension. <laughs> I got over my nervousness right there. Sure. Yeah. That was it. What? <laughs> <laughs> he had no idea another band was even on stage. Yeah. So he's like, prepare to die, you little limey. <laughs> <laughs> bam, bam. <laughs> That's fantastic. I love it. Yeah. yeah, so incredible story with Mitch Mitchell. Tell me about your experience with Jimi Hendrix. How did you uh, connect with him? You know, you, you'd seen, you would have seen him uh, in, in, in the Monterey thing, you know, and all the, all the footage and, 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 the, and the TV stuff and listened to his records and seen the photographs of him and stuff. But when you see him in person coming down the hallway with a, you know, with orange silk pants, a purple silk shirt, a fuchsia purple jacket, and you know, and a lime green, you know, scarf around his head, carrying a guitar with a cigarette hanging out of his lip, you know, hey man, cool, how's it going? It's just like, wow. <laughs> he was a bigger than life, and, and uh, what, a, what a musician, what a, what a guitar player live to watch him play was just, it's one thing to see uh, see footage of it, but to, but to actually see him play was was unbelievable. And he was, you know, I remember uh, he he he, uh, he had a, that cigarette dangling in the back of his uh, corner of his mouth, and he's walking through the backstage area, and one of the stage hands worked did it and said, "Oh, excuse me, uh, there's no smoking back here. You have to put that cigarette out." He goes, "Hey, man, it's part of my act." <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's just like, it's just pretty cool, you know. Yeah, yeah. You're not gonna stop. Um, you're not gonna stop Jimmy from doing that, right? At the, at the time, though, I think he was not real happy with the way his record company and, and some of his business stuff was going, and he, he was trying really hard to 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 move into into some different different things. Uh, and I wish he'd been able to because. Oh, can you imagine if he if he'd been around all these years and was still out there playing today? What what he would have? I can only imagine what he would have uh, contributed. Right. Yeah, un unbelievable artist. Yeah, and that goes for for how, how long is that list? So many people. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Sadly, tragically, whether yeah. drugs or otherwise, we've mm. lost a lot of people. Right. So I also want to talk about. Roland, your art, you're, again, you're not only just the bass player in the band, you're doing some incredible art. You also have a documentary film, Why the Artist Creates. Can we talk about your passion for art and how that also came about? I can't remember how it started because it's always been, I've always loved to draw. Just, uh, just I remember being about five years old and, and, uh, it being Thanksgiving at my grandparents' house, and uh, all of the, all the family was there, and there was a little kind of passageway between the, between down along the, the big their big dining room table where everybody sat, and they'd come from the kitchen, walk down this way. But I'd be right on the floor in the pathway drawing pictures. People would be stepping over me, you know. And uh, uh, all I can say is, like, I I can remember drawing a picture of a mailbox and looking at it and saying, "Hey, I like I like what I did." I like that mailbox. And so I was really just doing it for myself. You know, I wasn't trying to, and I never really, really, even now I don't, I don't think I, I paint or draw with, with, the, with the idea that it's going to impress anybody. It's just, it's just a, can I get this? Can I make this thing happen the way I want it to happen? So it's kind of just, a, it, it's, it's really a nice, nice thing to be able to do it because it's me and me. Mm -hmm. Right, and I'm not not in that that collective 
situation of, of playing music, and it's a nice uh, it's a nice interlude or break or counterbalancing uh, element to where you, I, I can do anything I want. If I want to paint a tree yellow, I can make it yellow. If I, if I didn't like it, I can change it to you know any color. I want to use any color, do any kind of composition, pick any subject. It, it's freedom for me. It's pers- kind of personal freedom. And uh, well, I've always always love drawing and, and and if you can draw folks you can paint <laughs> it's it's the next step yeah and with your documentary too why the artist creates uh this was uh it won a national silver telly award and was nominated for an emmy that must have felt nice that was well that was it that was um there's a couple in cleveland um bob and luann bowl becker are the ones who made that, and they they contacted me because they they're they're um, documentary uh, filmmakers. They they made a a few nice documentaries on on baseball players, kind of like kind of like what you're doing now, only with baseball players that people haven't really really uh, become deeply aware of, you know, or extensively aware of. Kind of interesting. They did a good one on urban sprawl, which is kind of you know really interesting. All all these topics are great. They are they're very interesting, very very uh, uh, cool documentary people. And they, uh, they, they contacted me, Luann contacted me and said, we want to make, a, uh, make a, a video of why the artist creates. Now, I'm not sure I answered that question, particularly in that documentary yet, because I don't know if there is any one given uh, you know, answer for why, why an artist creates. For me, it's just, just, just to satisfy my own uh, my own uh, uh, investigative you know, potential as, 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 you know, to get colors that work together, you know, and stuff. I, I love it. I love it. I always have. Well, and that sounds like a big part of the reason right there is just because you love it and, and it makes you happy. What more reason do you need, right? So. Yeah. If, if you love to do something, you're most likely going to get around to it. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. You know, the way that we got connected here, I think, is a pretty fun story. Uh, My friend Pete Smith and Goodwin Cobb, they own a a pet supply store in Portland, Maine, called Uncommon Paws, uncommonpaws.com. And uh, you walked in while you were in Portland, Maine, touring with Chris, and uh, you you and Pete got to talking, and somehow it connected with the show. And can you, so I have a question from Pete, if you're, if you're willing. Uh, I, I gave him a question uh, that obviously your love of dogs, and I, I have a dog as well, but Woody is your dog. Yeah, he's my dog. Yeah, so what role has Woody played in your life and any kind of inspiration with music with Woody? You know, as a musician, traveling musician, I, you know, we go out on the road a lot, so there's periods of time when we're in and out of, out of our homes, you know, and um, uh, that's that's one of those double-bladed axes. Of course, you need to go out and, and work, and you want to go out and work, but it, but it also, you know, leaves leaves a vacancy, you know, back at your house. So there's that, you know, which is felt for certain. And um, uh, so my partner Lita, she um, she is a dog lover. She's, she, of course, I had a dog when I was a kid, but she's, she's been a nonstop dog lover you know, for her whole life. And uh, uh, she said to me one day, you know, maybe we can get a dog. I said, well, I'm going to be gone, and you come out and see me, you know, on the road and stuff. There's going to be a lot of traveling. And she goes, well, let's get a little dog. Let's get a lunch bucket dog, you know. <laughs> we can carry him right on the plane. I started thinking about it, and I was kind of going, ah, I don't know. And she, she said, it would really help when you go away on the road because uh, it gets kind of lonesome around here and I'd like to have a little buddy, you know? And, you know, uh, next thing, she says, take a look at this. You know, she flips open the, the laptop and there's a picture of this little doggy there. And, uh, and she, I said, yeah. She said, he's going to be down at the pet store on Saturday with his brother and sisters. They're giving him away. They've rescued him out of the out of the desert, and uh, can we just go look? We know what that leads to, right? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> uh, so we went down there, and they, there were five little puppies in this uh, in this le- in this uh, litter, and um, they named them all after cheeses. You know, there was Monty, the 
that's the money. There was Rico and uh, Colby and I forget the other ones, but Monty was the one that we that we really hooked up with. Of course, yeah, we, we couldn't call him Monty, so we changed his name to Woody. Uh, but uh, we took it, we brought him home, and he walked in the door. First thing he did is take a dump right on the floor, you know, mark the territory, and uh, all he's but. What a great little guy he is. He's great. He's been great. And he's, he's a great companion to for when I'm not here. He's, he will let you know religiously if anybody's around, you know, he's very uh, vocal about that. And uh, I'm surprised he hasn't chimed in already. Uh, but uh, he changed, when you get a dog, it changes your life. I mean, you, 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 get, uh, you get into a whole thing with him. And he's, you know, he's another person. You bet. You bet. Yeah. Our, our Mark Alexander, the great, you know, the, the, the Russian guy, his, one of his famous quotes is, the more I see of men, the more I like my dog. <laughs> <laughs> They're definitely part of the family, aren't they? No yeah. yeah. And, and maybe, so, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so, uh, uh, Woody's uh, 10 pounds, right? He's a little guy. He's a cross between a, a Chihuahua and, and a, um, Italian Greyhound. So, um, I want to get him, I'm looking for a little, if anybody knows, I'm looking for a little frisbee that'll fly that, uh, that's not going to like seem like, you know, a giant flying saucer to him, something he can manage. So that's how it happened in Pete's place. I was walking around, uh, walking around in Portland, Maine, and this is one of those things where, you know, you bump into people and you, uh, you just kind of hit it off for some reason. I went in there and, you know, he's got, his, his shop is, it's an unusual, it is an unusual pause uh, in the name of the shop. It's an unusual dog shop because you've got a lot of things there you don't see in other places. And um, I said, hey, would you happen to have a tiny little Frisbee in here? That, that, that He goes, I don't. He goes, but I know what you're talking about. We started talking. And uh, that's, he said, he said I, know, I know a fellow named David Ward who you might want to talk to, you know. I mean, it, I like Pete. And I said, well, let's... Uh, Let's stay in touch. And he said, okay. And then he didn't tell me about you that day. He said, told me about you in a subsequent email, you know. Yeah. And he's, he's, hunting, uh, he's hunting for a little frisbee. And that's what he said. And that's what he said as well, Roland. He wants to send you a six-inch disc. Uh, so that's what he's working on. He wanted me to make sure to let you know that. Okay. A six-inch frisbee. Six-inch frisbee. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Bring it on. <laughs> Love to see that. Yeah. Well, and you know, what you're talking about, just even that for an example, but throughout your whole career also, I think, is the power of networking. And you were talking about that earlier with just connecting with people, like when you were in Woodstock and in the studio, and that's how bands came about, and that's how it happened with Chris Isaac as well. That's a pretty powerful um thing right there for folks to do any words of advice for musicians in networking well the, you know the the social media you know online networking thing is 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 huge and it's kind of almost i mean it's keeping people glued to their computers a lot these days a lot i i, I think anyway i don't i don't do that too much but because I remember the days when there were there was no such thing as a cell phone or a computer, and it was all about getting up off the couch and going somewhere. And uh, uh, the day that I ran into Pete, for instance, uh, it was a day off in Maine, and I wanted to 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 go in. I had to go into the post office actually to do something. So we, I Ubered into town, went to the post office, and then I said, oh, I would like to walk down and check out the wharf because I, I, as a painter, you know, I like to. See, especially I love to be around water and, and where boats are and things. Just it always looks great to me. Every every frame is looking great, you know. Yeah. And on my way back, I walked in, saw this dog shop, and I was seeing about Woody, you know. And there was a lot of dogs, by the way. Portland is a dog town. Yes, it is. Beautiful, beautiful four-legged friends in uh, in Portland. Um, happened into Pete's place, and we just started talking. Now. That's the kind of thing that happens when you, when, you, when you start mixing around with people. I don't think it can be replaced online. I don't think, I don't think it can be. I think you really have to keep up your, your skills. You keep your antenna out. You know, keep, keep your eyes open for interesting people because they're out there. And, uh, and when you meet somebody face-to-face, 
there's no replacing it. If you make a certain kind of connection with somebody, you know, you, 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 it's about energy. You know, you find, uh, you find, you find a certain kind of energy that's coming out of somebody and you can relate to it. And then, you know, it sparks conversation and, uh, it's, it's, there's something special about it. And, and, uh, I've, I've found that the coolest things that have happened to me have come from those kind of things where I actually physically went somewhere expecting nothing. Mm -hmm. and, and the, in fact, the least, the less you expect sometimes, the more you, the more you fall into in, in a funny, funny way. Uh, yeah. But there's no replacing it, I don't think, for face-to-face. -face. Go, go out, get off, the, get off the couch and go do some, some smoothing around and gumshoe your way. In, in and out of different situations, you never know who you're going to meet. That's right. Yep. I love it. And, and so glad that we got to connect with this here as well through Pete. Yeah. So thanks to Pete uh, mm -hmm. and Gudrun there. So, um, you know, you, you seem like a really creative guy, musically, art wise, songwriting. Can you share a little bit about your creative process and how you go about, you, even like with something, writing a song, whether killing the blues or otherwise, what's your process with that? Well, you know, there are, there are guys who, who write a lot of songs and I don't write a lot of songs. I, I, I'm anything but a, uh, but a, let's say a professional songwriter in the sense that, you know, I. I have a quota or anything like that. I, I only write when I when I feel like writing. And um, uh, again, it's it, there's a lot of chance and a lot of luck involved. It's just like like going out to meet people. Um, I remember killing the blues. I was feeling really, really, you know, broken hearted. Uh, I was dealing with some pain, you know, over this thing that had happened. Uh, where, where, where you know we had to, we had to, had to split up and. Um, that night, I was talking to, and I remember her name, her name was Heidi Blackburn. Heidi, if you're out there. <laughs> um, we were sitting at a bar, or I was standing at a bar somewhere. Just, and I, she asked, hey, what's been going on? And I told her what happened. What's, what's happened. I said, yeah, you're fine. And I, now I'm in this situation. She said, I know. She said, it's just so horrible when you've got to go out and find something that you already had. And that line stuck with me, you know, and that's one of the lines in that song. I think I kind of wrote that song around, around uh, killing the blues around that, that line, at least was, it was a good linchpin, you know, to get a, get a bunch of other lines in there that, that, that pertain to what I was feeling at the time. Right. Uh, there's no process really for me. It's, um, it's, uh, I have to sort of be, have to be feeling something. I have to, my, my songs come from, from personal experiences and interfaces and, and emotional stuff, you know. I'm not a real good documentary songwriter. It's, uh, it's uh, most of the stuff that actually happened to me, and then I have to feel strongly about it. And songs come, uh, songs come when I least expect them. And you can miss a song by by not paying attention to, to little things, you know. So uh, I just try to pay attention, and, and 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 I don't, I can't I find it hard to write a song that I don't like. Mm. I mean, I don't know how people. People do that. I have a friend who lives up the street. He goes, he goes, you know, he goes, and he's a songwriter. Um, he goes, I hate to collaborate. <laughs> he said, I just hate it. He goes, he goes, every time I hear a song that's a collaboration, I can always tell that you've got, this part was done by this guy, and this part was done by these. I can always tell the patchwork quilt aspect of it, which is, I mean, I don't know if that's valid or not, because, you know, there's, there's millions of great collaborations, but... I don't mind collaborating in certain situations when, the, when, when you know, somebody's not trying to force anything. When there's two people who are able and willing to sort of let things happen, you know, and including me. <laughs> um, uh, no, I, I couldn't say there's a process. I get my process is no process. Right. right. Yeah, so, but I love it. It's not forced. It's not formulaic. It sounds like it's from the heart. It's from your experience. Uh, and you got to feel it for it to come out. Is, yeah. is, there, is there anything you're working on now? I have a few songs. Yeah, I am going to make another record um, soon uh, of some, some stuff. There's a lot of songs or a number of songs that need to be finalized and put, put over. But, you know, I find that hard to do, too. And, and, and of course, that's that's the struggle. You know, it's okay, you've done a record or you've written some songs now. Are you going to do it again and when? You know, people ask that question. 
remember Sean, Sean Colvin and I were talking not long ago, and she said, yeah, it's the best record I just did. She practically killed me. She said, I just couldn't get the songs out, you know? And uh, Amazing. I know what that feels like, because you're under the gun, you've got a deadline, and you know, sometimes it works for people, and sometimes it doesn't. You know, I, I, I'm pretty good friends with John Prine, and we, you know, we traveled together a lot, and uh, we, we were, uh, we were uh, talking one night on the bus, and I had some, one of his songs, and I said, how long did it take you to write that song? He goes, 12 years. Oh, wow. And right on, man. He was, he was obviously, I wasn't. Uh, yeah, John Schumann too, then, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and he's written some incredible songs as well, no question. Mm -hmm. right. so, and, you know, painting's the same way. I don't, I, 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 you just have to pay attention. I kind of, with painting, I'll be driving along, and I'll throw, throw my plants off on the side of the road and catch a broken red against some kind of, you know, impossible gray, and I'll stop the car and just have to, have to check it out and circle it and see if there's a composition there. And, you know, uh, but it's, it's just, again, it's, it, it's because for some reason I looked to the left at that moment and uh, there, there it was. But once I see something, if I want to paint it, I, it it's like, the, you know, the game's on, you know. Can you tell us about your beautiful guitar and bass here? And if you don't mind, oh, this, um, this bass, this is an old, beautiful. this is a 1961 precision bass that uh, used to belong to a friend of mine named Debbie Green, who is, uh, she, she was married to Eric Anderson, the folk singer, uh, for some years. And she, she's a great, great musician herself. And, uh, just a great person, and we were in a band in Woodstock with Happy and Artie Tron at one point in the 70s, in um, 72 or something, and we played in New York City, and I had a fabulous old 1960 uh, um, Fender jazz bass that we'd, we'd uh, finished our show, and we went to deliver the keys to, we'd say to someone's apartment in the village, and we went to deliver the keys back to the place, and we were only out of the car, classic story, for maybe, 28 seconds. And when I came back, my bass was gone. Oh, no. New York City has a way of uh, showing you the ropes. <laughs> and uh, that bass was gone. And it was, it was that bass, every note on that bass was, was, was a symphony. It was one of those instruments. And, and of course, it, it, it disappeared and evaporated. And who knows where it is now. But um, I looked all over for months for, for a replacement. And Debbie said, You know, I've got an old precision. You can try, <clears throat> you can borrow it until you do find one. So I borrowed this bass actually and had it for a while and, and, I, and I fell in love with it because it, it was as good as my, as my uh, jazz bass. And, um, but I couldn't find anything that was anywhere near the two of them. And, and I went to a number of bases and finally I had to just give it back and say, I can't keep this forever, it's your bass. And then, of course, she, she went her way and I went my way. And, and, and probably 30 years later, not, not that long ago, um, I was talking to somebody who I'd known from another time in my life. Who, she was a real estate agent <clears throat> you know, up in, up in uh, Marin County in California. <clears throat> and started talking, for some reason, started talking about bases. And her, Debbie, Debbie Green's name came up. And, uh, I said, yeah, she had, a, she had the greatest bass back, way back in the day. You know? And she said, she's selling that bass right now. I said, what? And I called her up. I said, Debbie. She said, she said, oh. she said I'm so glad you called. She goes, because I was afraid I was going to have to throw this bass out into the, you know, into the, into the world <clears throat> of unknowns. People, she said, I'd love you to have it. So I got it back. And here it is. And I use this in the studio all the time. This bass is... Uh, it's a problem solver when it comes to, 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 to playing in the studio. If you can see, it ain't no pretty bird, but it, but it sounds fabulous. It's a bass, great bass. And uh, so... I think it's beautiful. Good hands, Debbie. Yeah, thank you, Debbie. <laughs> this this, bass, uh, this uh, guitar is an old Gibson J35 from back in the day. It's 1938. Uh, and... You know, you know, the reason Gibson named their guitars like J35s and J45s is because that's how much they cost when they first came out. Thank you, Roland Sally, for being on Musicians on the Record. You're so welcome.